Well, welcome to church. You may be seated. Thank you, guys. And uh, I just love being able to gather together with you. And uh, man, we're in this brand new series called Trolling for Hope. I think it's gonna be a big one, an important one. And I wanna thank you for joining us, uh, especially on the 5th of July. Last night was the craziest 4th of July celebration I've ever seen because we canceled our like big fireworks. And so everybody said, you know what? We're gonna have big fireworks in our driveway. And like getting out of my subdivision was like national lampoons, like just literally slaloming around all this debris from these fireworks packages. Fireworks have gotten a lot better. You know what I mean? It used to be like you put the thing in the little cannon shell and then boom, it went up. Now, like you light a box and this robotic box puts on a full show, timed and whatever. And people would light off like 20 of those boxes in my, I mean, it was crazy. It was, I've never seen that many fireworks in my life. It was kind of cool. But anyway, I'm really glad to be back at church. I was on vacation the week preceding last and um, my family watched online and everybody's been like, oh, pastor, online is amazing. It's just as good as the real thing. Lies, not nearly, okay? And maybe, maybe if you don't have kids, I love my children, but let me tell you, trying to watch a sermon with dad, 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 daddy, 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 what, what? You know what I mean? And it's like, now I'm sinning and I'm trying to watch church, and this is just bad, my anger. So anyway, I'm glad to be here with you. I'm glad we can be together. And um, you know, we've been praying and looking at COVID, and man, what is a wise thing to do? And uh, I am glad to say uh, fatality continues to drop. We are at our lowest point, 90% from the peak nationally, and Indiana is like better than ever. Um, Even though cases are flat or rising in many places, I'd encourage you to watch fatalities uh, because they drop very quickly. And that's what we started with. The narrative kind of switched to number of cases. But um, I still take it seriously. I just, I've been thinking about kids and uh, I really care about my kids knowing Jesus. You know what I mean? And that's something I try to show them at home, but it's also something that I think should happen at church. And so we've been talking about what are we gonna do for that? And uh, there's gonna be no pressure, no guilt if you don't wanna check your kids in, but I wanna start offering a full kids ministry again, just because I want our kids um, to hear the gospel of Jesus. So right now, thank you, that's cool. Um, so the plan is July 19th. And if, if something were to change with that, like if we you know, face an issue, maybe you know, we'll be flexible. But right now we're praying and hoping that we can begin doing that. We'll still have capacity limits on our classrooms. And if we did you know, reach a certain level, maybe we'd have to close an age group. But the hope is that we can start um, telling our older kids about Jesus in an age appropriate uh, environment in a curriculum that's engaged for them too, so, or designed for them too. So that's hopefully coming back on July 19th. That's great. Uh, and... I just want to thank you for coming to church in person. I love being with you guys, and uh, it means so much more um, to us, I think, than we thought, especially after having gone without it. And I just think my spirit um, is blessed by church. It just is. So I'm calling you now. This will be the most important and controversial series of the year. July 19th, we're having a special church meeting at all of our services. It will still be a worship experience, but during each of our Sunday services, you're gonna wanna be here. It's part of this series. It's gonna be controversial. It's gonna be meaningful. And if you love Jesus and you like this church a little bit, you're gonna wanna be here. If you don't love Jesus, but you like this church a little bit, or you're interested in learning about him, you're gonna wanna be here July 19th. And uh, we will also be online that weekend, but it's likely, not for sure, haven't determined yet, that we will not post it after the fact. So, Whatever. And then also I'll share with you, this is just an update, but um, we've been talking about what can we do with our air handlers in the auditorium to continue to make it as safe as possible. And uh, we upped our MERV filters. I don't know what that means, but you know, our filters, I guess, are better. Um, But they're not as good as they could be because now we can get these UV lights that apparently are supposed to help kill coronavirus. I don't know if they like zap it 100%, but we're getting those put in um, hopefully by the 19th. So they'll shine UV light on the coronavirus and help mitigate it. So anyway, today is July 5th and we celebrate our freedom to worship Jesus. That is literally what this day is about. That is what this country was begun for so we could have the freedom of religion and the freedom to gather together. And I can think of nothing more patriotic than coming together to exercise that freedom. But I just want to acknowledge the millions of mostly men who have died so that we could be here today. And now we have service women also who are in active duty and in places of conflict. Um, I just want to say thank you to God for laying it on the hearts of millions of people to serve and die so that we could be here. It's a big deal. This series is a commentary 
on the climate of today. And our graphic takes some cues from the movie Trolls. I don't know if you guys have seen this movie. I have heard the soundtrack on repeat for like the last many years of my life. And it's still good, but it is getting a little old. But anyway, we're gonna be talking about this movie over the next several weeks, like little little bits and pieces of it and uh, taking some truths out of it. To lay a foundation today, I actually wanna go to the predecessors of these trolls, not the grandparents, but the great, great grandparents. Remember these, these are the grandparents of the Trolls movie. We had these, anybody ever have one of these? This is creepy. Like, I look at this, and I'm like, I literally, this is almost offensive. I was like, can I even put that picture up? Like, but this is what we had, all of us just sitting by our bed. Like, look at this, I have a troll. This was cool. And just to think about how much better injection molding has gotten. Like, those eyes, terrifying. But anyway, I'm talking about this guy's great-grandparents. I'm talking about the trolls from Grimm's Fairy Tale, bridge trolls. You know what I mean? Those guys who used to be under the bridge, the fantasy creature that, you know, if you would cross a bridge and you couldn't answer the question or pay the toll, that's where toll comes from, the trolls, you know, if you couldn't pay the toll, they would um, boil you in their pot and kill you and eat you, which is like, oh, that's scary. You know what I mean? Trolls represented evil selfishness. They had no friends because they found a way to make everyone an enemy in their life. I don't know if you've ever met anyone like that. And they were relational terrorists. They hurt everyone around them, including themselves, with loneliness anger and fear. Bridge trolls don't exist today, but people trolls are common and thriving. You know the types of people I'm talking about. The people who troll you by throwing a fit at Walmart because they're sold out of TV stands because they need, you know, a third TV mount for their third TV in their third bathroom. And it's like, really? Like, it's not the manager's fault that they are out of TV mounts. You know what I mean? It's just like, why are you losing your mind over that? Trolls are the type of people who hold you hostage with guilt and bully tactics and relationships. Trolls are the type of people who get kicked out of men's intramural under 25 recreational sports leagues by screaming at the refs. It's like, what's wrong with you? You know, we're all, why, why do you have to lose your mind like that? Fun story, I am the star of each of those three stories. I have done each of those three things. That's actually just describing myself because here's the truth. I've been a bit of a troll. We can all be trolls. What I want you to understand fundamentally as we start is trolls are everywhere. Being a troll is natural because of sin. We all have a little troll on us. If you think that this talk is about those people, oh, I'm so glad pastor is gonna just go after those people who have those problems. You're missing the whole point. That's not what, it's not about those people. This is about us, this is about you and me. I wanna look into our hearts and I wanna find places where we're struggling with the sin of trolling. Sin is sin because it hurts relationships. Fundamentally, that's what trolls do. They block, burn, destroy, and impede the bridges of relationship. The key sign of a troll to me is someone who feels like everyone's out to get them. Everyone in power is out to destroy them. A troll is a being who lives alone, proverbially and relationally, under a bridge, protecting their little emotional island. Trolls usually have been dealt a decent hand in life, but they're losing with it and they feel like it's a bad hand. In America, I think there's a lot of trolls. We've all been dealt decent hands. We live in the richest country in human history at the most prosperous time in human history. Even if we are the worst off of all Americans, we still have a great life. And yet so many of us manage to feel like we have a bad life. Trolls are not red or blue. They're not Democrats or Republicans necessarily. They're not guys or gals, they're human. And if you feel offended, maybe this is because you struggle a little bit with trolling. And I think that trolling is the greatest single issue in America today. The greatest issue. A trolling spirit is what is dividing and killing our country. It's easy and weak and sinful to burn, ghost, and troll every bridge that makes you feel a little bit negative. It's easy to say, ah, I'm just gonna cut off that bridge. That's exactly what we're doing. It's hard and difficult to build bridges and to listen to the enemy. It's even harder to earn the right to speak, to capture hearts, to persuade and to lead people across the bridge of relationship that are very different than you. But that is what America needs for healing. This is July 4th weekend, and if you love Jesus and you love this country, and you want to be a part of the solution, you want to be a part of healing a broken world, this message is for you. And I don't believe that it will be easy, but I believe it will be helpful. I wanna start by laying out three primary attributes of trolls, and I originally had five, but I had to whittle it down. Um, I'm gonna list these off and I'm coming to your house. I'm coming to your living room. I was on vacation, you know, two weeks ago and I just realized I don't wanna lead a big church full of lukewarm people who love God as one of many good things in their life. I wanna lead a church that calls people to a full and complete devotion to Jesus Christ as the only hope in the world. I wanna call us to repentance and growth and conviction every week. I want this to be a place where we can level up and be challenged. 
And I don't just want to blow your minds with an interesting message that's theologically rich and expository verse by verse, even though that's what we're doing this week. Um, I want to challenge you to a deeper love and commitment and devotion to Jesus. Everyone at some point in this message might feel a little bit hopefully convicted, though some of, us, some of us with thinner skin may feel attacked. I just want you to remember that we can't grow without recognizing the need to grow. So let's grow together. Please don't shut down mentally or walk out physically until I finish the message today. Now, back to the three traits of trolls. The three traits of trolls. Number one, trolls demand that you agree with and submit to them to cross the bridge of relationship. For a troll, if you don't agree, then we can't have a relationship. That's the way it goes. Trolls are not tolerant, they're intolerant. They will naturally say that they're tolerant, but by definition, they're intolerant. You can't cross the bridge of a relationship with a troll if you don't enslave yourself to their opinion. 100% submission or 100% silence is the only thing a troll will accept. You must enslave yourself to me. For a troll, it typically works. They say, I'm the victim, you're the offender. And in order to make it right, I'm gonna hold this guilt over your head. You're the slave, I'm the master and power holder. You, if you don't submit, then I'll unfriend you and I'll block you and I'll call you a bad person. How do you like me now? Right, that's how they work. Number two, trolls want to focus only on what they hate. They don't want to persuade people to love what they love. I read a great book this week called The Three Languages of Politics. And this really is the language of politics today. It's not about what we love together. It's not about, hey, here are a set of ideals. We believe in this type of government and let's all rally around our love for this type of government and this is the way things should be ran. It's all about the other people are evil. Look how bad they are. Do you see how ridiculous this group is? I mean, they're just dumb and terrible and evil and they're just trying. I mean, can you believe it? And you know, I don't have a TV. I haven't really been engaged with a lot of the political narrative recently. I mean, I do read articles, but as far as watching. So I went on YouTube and I actually just watched some random, cli random clips. And it was like, Don Lemon is so hateful, like unbelievable. Some of the Fox News hosts I saw, I was like, are you serious right now? Like, this is so mean. Like all it is, is just, they're terrible and they're terrible. And if you agree with them, you're terrible and everything's terrible. And it's like, wow, not loving. It's not about building consensus. It's about making our party more focused on our tribe and closing our minds to what other people believe. That's the political narrative today. And that's what trolls do. Instead of reaching out to build consensus or build a bridge, it's all about burning the bridge. We do this with friends. We do this politically. We do this with our relationships. It's almost become natural. It's interesting. I did some reading about where this has come from. Sociologists attribute much of this to the decline in church attendance in America. It turns out church attendance was a part of the fabric of our society with a level and capacity that we really underestimated. Within the last 10 years, as church attendance has really begun to decline rapidly, um, we've begun to see this increase in polarization. Church in America played this critical, pivotal role in society where Democrats and Republicans, rich, poor, young, and old, would come together, libertarians, don't forget about them, would come together to celebrate who we're for and what we love rather than what we're against. And when you subtract that from society, we end up with a place that is pretty negative. Number three, trolls will condemn and bully you and dehumanize you if you disagree with them. Trolls say, you are 100% for me or you're 100% evil. It's not just you're against me, you're evil. And we see this all the time, trolling everywhere. If you don't support this movement, then you are evil. If you don't fly this type of flag, then you're a bigot. If you don't see it this way, then you're unpatriotic and you're destroying the country. If you don't believe in this specific thing, then you're racist. If you don't speak out like I do, then you're evil. Instead of pointing at a specific issue and calling people to come together to fix it with a tangible result, we just say, if you don't agree with me, you're evil, you're evil. And this is the problem. Trolls don't try to win hearts or persuade or to build a movement. They believe that might makes right. They believe that overpowering, enslaving, disenfranchising, and destroying people rather than persuading and building relationships is the way to do things. If you don't agree with me, then you're evil so I can destroy you. That is not what Jesus did. Jesus is unique. Jesus was the first teacher in human history that gave everyone the freedom to choose him or not. He gave compassion to those who disagreed with him. He loved his enemies. He prayed for those who persecuted him. He sought to build relationships with rather than condemn people. And instead of con uh, condemning and dehumanizing people, he broke down ra racial barriers through relationships, which is remarkable. He broke down cultural barriers with friendship and he changed minds with love and friendship. This unique Christian value has transformed the world. And it's something that we take for granted today. You see intolerance in societies that don't follow this teaching of Jesus. Think about it. 
In the Muslim Middle East, people are beheaded, stoned, disenfranchised, excluded from society for disagreeing with the trolls. In atheist nations, particularly in China, but also Russia, people are sent to concentration camps for disagreeing with the trolls because might makes right. That's not what Jesus taught. In increasingly secular Canada, people have now lost their freedom of speech. People are imprisoned and punished for following Jesus. And I would say in the university system, the secular university system in the United States of America, in particular, people are punished, disenfranchised, and excluded for following Jesus because might makes right if you're a troll. It's no surprise that the decline of Christianity in the West brings the decline of tolerance and the rise of might makes right and hatred, which I think is very much the spirit, attitude, and action of the demonic. That's trolling. What is Satan at the end of the day? A troll, a troll. Jesus faced trolls in his life. It's not all bad. And Jesus handled trolls really well. I want you to see this example from the Bible. It's kind of remarkable. In Jesus' day, there were two kinds of primary trolls. And this is kind of interesting. There were the red trolls that I call the Pharisees. And then there were the blue trolls called the Sadducees. The red trolls, this is kind of interesting. They were all for small government, low taxes, traditional family values. They were constitutionalists. Sound familiar? Okay. True story though. You can read the Bible. It's true. Um, The Sadducees were sort of secular. They wanted big government. They wanted big federal government responsibility. They wanted more Roman involvement. Um, They were against religion. They were essentially atheists. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They saw thought there were some good things to take from religion, but in general, they were secularists. And that's just the way that it was in Jesus's day. It was much more polarized than we are today. These two groups were locked in this troll battle in the Jewish Congress called the Sanhedrin. And throughout Jesus's life, you'll see this format, okay? Jesus would go on Fox News and talk with a Pharisee and uh, they wouldn't be able to win him over, make him hate what they hate. And then CNN would come and interview him And he talked with the blue trolls, the Sadducees, and they would kind of troll him and try and get him to hate what they hate. And you see this about five different times in the New Testament, five different stories across all the gospels where Jesus has a conversation first with the Pharisees and then the Sadducees over and over again. I picked one of them that I think is kind of remarkable and poignant for the topic of today. And uh, that comes out of Matthew chapter 22. We're gonna kind of go through it verse by verse. But starting in verse 15, it says, then the red trolls, the Pharisees, met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Notice, their goal isn't to engage Jesus in dialogue. Their goal isn't to have a real conversation with Jesus. Their goal is to make Jesus hate what they hate or to hate Jesus back. That's what they want. They sent some of their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to meet with him. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. Okay, so this empty, flattering words, it's like, oh, come on. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's frustrating. You are impartial and you don't play favorites. Now tell us, what do you think about this? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? This is such a loaded question. There's so much socio-political and historical background in this. Their goal is to make people hate Jesus or to make Jesus hate what they hate. They want to see his true colors shining through. If he's not on their team, they want to alienate him and they want to destroy him. If he is on their team, they want to use him as a tool. Now his answer is brilliant right here. It says in verse 18, but Jesus knew their motives. You hypocrites, he said. Why are you trying to trap me? I love how powerfully he starts out. I feel like today as Christians, we're a little squeamish of being involved or engaged in any conversations. And Jesus right off the bat says, hey, it's okay to have conversations with people. And it's okay to call the trolls out for being trolls. I will not be trolled by you. I see what you're doing and I will not kiss your shoes. I will not bow to you. I will not be silent. This isn't about red or blue. This is about people loving God. In verse 19, he goes on here. Show me uh, the coin used for the tax. When they handed him a Roman coin, he asked, whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well, then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. His reply amazed them. And they went away. The trolls went away. Now, This is one of the most theologically and sociopolitically rich statements in all of scripture. And I wish I could spend a long time unpacking the significance and the historical value of him referencing one of the 10 commandments, talking about graven images and God's image everywhere, but I I just don't have time. The bottom line is that Jesus refuses to hate on anyone. He won't hate the Romans. He won't hate God. He wants to build bridges to all of people's hearts. He doesn't want to choose a side. And everybody's amazed by this because in Jesus' day, everybody has a team, a tribe that they hate the other people with. So the Sadducees are like, well, if he's not a blue troll or not a red troll, he must be a blue troll. So they come up to him and they have a conversation. And this is the format you always see, right? That same day, he was approached by some blue trolls, some Sadducees, religious leaders who say there is no resurrection from the dead. They're sort of atheists, they're secularists. They say religion's moving out of society. Society's corrupt. We want to rebuild a new, better society. And they posed this question. Now, 
The red trolls ask a question about Jesus' doctrine. The blue trolls, they just ask a question that is designed to mock the red trolls. That's all it is. It's a hateful, mean question. You can read it if you want, but the bottom line, and I'm not gonna read it today, but the bottom line is Jesus refuses to hate on anyone. He's not gonna hate the Romans. He's not gonna hate anyone. And so in verse 29, he replies, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. He refuses to pay the toll. He says, look, I'm not gonna respond to that question that's all about hate. I don't wanna do it. I refuse to let you troll me. I'm gonna keep the bridge open. I'm gonna keep pursuing you and I refuse to make my movement about what I'm against. I wanna build consensus. In his day, the red trolls were focused on defeating an enemy, not building a society. And the blue trolls were focused on destroying what they felt was a corrupt society, not reforming the people within it. And the end result was that in AD 70, the nation of Israel would be completely destroyed, exactly as Jesus predicted. And Jesus says, I have no part of this. I don't wanna do this. Instead, he focuses on one relationship at a time. He says, this isn't about hating other people. This is about building consensus and relationship. Think about how Jesus did it. Jesus goes to the town of Samaria and he meets this woman at a well and he broke down the barriers of racism and sexism. He breaks down the barriers of discrimination. He builds a relationship with this lady. He builds a conversation with her. And then at the end of it, at the end of it, after he had built a relationship, he said, go and sin no more. And I think that's beautiful. I think so many of us try to say, go and sin no more first, but that's not the way Jesus did it. To the tax collectors, he went to their house. He ate dinner with them. He built a relationship with them and he called them to go and sin no more, right? He built a relationship. Then he called them to repentance. Instead of hanging out with everyone who agreed with him, he built relationships with those who disagreed with him and he won their hearts. He refused to dig in and troll. And check out the crowd's response in verse 33. It says, when the crowds heard him, they were astounded at his teaching in a good way. They were in this polarized political climate and there was talk of civil war and there were riots and looting and burning and lots of trolling on both sides. Way, way, way more than we see in our side, like like, like see in our country today, like a lot. People felt squashed between these two steamrollers. They didn't pick a side. They were called evil. They couldn't please everybody. And Jesus plots this path between both. He navigates it perfectly and he takes away the troll's power. Jesus' friend group was actually made up of Sadducees and Pharisees, of conservatives and liberals, of red trolls and blue trolls. He taught that there was something greater than politics and he brought healing to a broken, polarized system and people. And I just wanna close with these last two thoughts about how Jesus did this. This is remarkable. My first, my first thought is like not that great. My second thought is like the best. This is what you came for, okay? Just so you know. But the first thought, um, Jesus didn't bow to a false god. And a false god in the Bible is called an idol. I was in a conversation with a friend of mine the other day, and uh, she is an atheist, sometimes an agnostic, but mostly an atheist, who was sort of trolling me about how I needed to speak out about some things, right? Just classic. You need to speak out about this or you're evil, right? And in the middle of the conversation, she said very passionately, John, you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. I don't believe that. I believe that the Democratic Party is the Savior and Lord of America. And the same passion you feel for Jesus is the same passion I feel for politics. And it was such a helpful reminder to me. She has become a troll because she's worshiping a false god. And whenever you worship a false god, you're going to be disappointed. That's what idol stands for. It doesn't offer life. So you worship this thing saying, oh, it's going to bring life to me. It's going to make me feel good. When this happens, when I have this relationship, when I have this thing happen in my life, then I'm going to feel good. And it doesn't bring you what you hoped it would. And so you end up angry and frustrated and trollish. I've never had any of those things give me what I'd hoped when a political party that I've identified with in the past has held control over all three branches of government, even when they do what I hope they would do. It doesn't offer life and enduring hope the way that Jesus does. When a relationship that I've always wanted becomes mine, it doesn't offer life. Even though I'm married to Kristen, who's like the most wonderful lady in the world, it doesn't offer life. If there is an earthly outcome that we look more to, more than Jesus, we're probably living in idolatry and we're gonna become a troll. Jesus never bowed to the Pharisees or Sadducees, especially today. If you love politics or are more fired up about politics or are more fearful about politics or ideology or a country than you are about building the kingdom of Jesus, that is bowing to a false God. And I'm not saying that being engaged in politics is a bad thing. But when politics supersede our love for God, when our passion for politics supersedes our passion for God's kingdom, there's an issue and it's gonna result in negativity in our heart. It's just not gonna be good. I wanna call you out of it. Number two, and this is the point you came for. I think that we need to be a loving hero by bringing people across the bridge, not burning it. This is what Jesus did. 
You see, I think that standing up for something that everyone is behind, that's weak. This is what we do in society that has brought about evil for generations. Something the media, Twitter, when everybody's behind, that's not heroic. Condemning your enemy with signs of hatred, that's not heroic. Shouting at people you disagree with, that's not heroic. Demanding, bullying, cajoling people into following you, that's not heroic. Standing up for something in spite of ridicule. In front of the fire hoses, as MLK did in Birmingham. Sitting in the restaurant as people pour stuff on top of you, but you peacefully protest and continue to dignify and love and build relationships. In the face of a shouting mob, that is heroic. Building relationships with and winning the heart of and building peace with an enemy, that is true heroism. And that's what Jesus did consistently. That is what is remarkable about him throughout the Bible. I wanna talk to you today about somebody who I think really personifies what Jesus lived like. His name is Daryl Davis. He's pretty famous. Some of you may have seen his picture recently, although um, I think his book, uh, uh, Common Courtesy, um, was really remarkable when it came out in 2017. But um, he was horrified by racism. Rather than shouting at people who were racists in his community, rather than saying, you're terrible and you need to change and this and that, what did he do? He built bridges. This man attended KKK rallies and began building relationships with KKK members. And what's truly remarkable to me is that in his life, he's seen over 200 different KKK members give him their ropes, repent of the sin of racism, and leave that life. And it wasn't because he held up a bunch of signs saying, you're terrible, it's because he loved, because he built bridges rather than burning them. This is exactly what Jesus did. He went to the woman at the well, and he built a relationship with her, and he loved her. And then he said, go and sin no more. How many people in our life could we do that with? I think for so many of us, not that many. As a Christian, if you, like me, feel bullied and trolled, our call is not to be silent. I think we should be engaged. But our call is not to fight fire with fire either. It's to love and to build bridges. That is the remarkable, unstoppable power of God in the world. That is what has transformed the world. As a Christian, if you're passionate about ending problems in America, maybe ending racism or ending this or that, listen, I think we all should be engaged with and passionate about the issues in our country. But I think we should do it like Jesus, one life at a time. If it's a Facebook post about blah, 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 bah, like that's not gonna change people's opinion, right? It's one life at a time. And it begins with forgiving in our own heart. Cause I think so many of us, we feel so much anger, so much anger. I keep thinking of my children. Whenever I get angry, I think of my children, not, okay, that didn't sound good. But I keep thinking of my children. And uh, this is my youngest two. This is Aurora, Grace and Eldon Daniel. And um, God forbid, if one of them were to grow up and be terrible with their life. I just, keep, I just keep thinking if one of them became like an extremist, if one of them became a hateful person, um, we all have trolling tendencies in our hearts. And I would hope that this church would continue to be a place where no one's perfect and everyone's welcome. I would hope that this church wouldn't be a place that holds up a sign saying, oh, you're terrible and you've done this and you've done that and you're bad and you're a racist and you're a bigot and this and that. I, I hope that that wouldn't be what our church is. I hope it would be a place where someone would take them out to eat and build a relationship with them and love them. What I keep reminding myself, and there, there are some people that really make me angry in society. And whenever I see portrayals of that, you know, whether it's, you know, people who are rioting on the left or people on the far right who are, are racist, I just keep thinking, these are people's Eldons and Auroras. These are sons and daughters of the King made in the image of God. And if I am a Christian, my call is not to undignify them, my call is not to hate them. My call is not to condemn them. I have received grace from Jesus and my call is to give grace through relationship, understanding, love, empathy, and a call to change and repentance. My hope is that people would treat my sons and daughters the same way that I'm called to treat their sons and daughters. And uh, I just wanna speak to the youngest generation. If you are a Gen Zer, if you are born 2000 after, um, I just see a lot of hatred in the youngest generations of America right now. Young millennials, young Gen Zers. I think it's really bad. I think I see a really extreme and sometimes arrogant culture with like just oversimplifying complicated issues with nasty memes and this and that. And I don't think there's a lot of empathy. I don't think there's a lot of understanding. And even if you disagree with somebody, even if you think their opinions are truly evil, what if you had the courage to love them? to understand them and to build a relationship with them. You would do far more good for the world than holding up a nasty sign saying you need to change. Sin through trolls is destroying us. It's destroying relationships. It's destroying our society. And we live in what I think has been the greatest country on earth. I love this country. I will never forget watching my mother become a citizen of this country. I'm so grateful for the opportunity that we have here. 
And I'm a patriotic person. And I believe that America is hurting. And Christians, Jesus is the answer to what this country needs. Keep thinking of the words in Romans, for everyone is sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. Doesn't say, yet God condemns us and holds up a nasty, angry sign about how bad we are and says, you're terrible and you have to change. It says, God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins, when he built a bridge between earth and heaven through his grace. And if we receive this grace, our call is to give this to others. I just, I believe that there's a lot of us, myself included today, who need to repent for trolling. Repent of anger and hatred in our hearts. I don't want to focus on condemning enemies. I want to focus on winning hearts. And I want to be clear, as Christians, now is the time to not be silent. Now is the time to declare the love of Jesus in this land. Yes, but we do it from a heart of love, compassion. Doesn't mean we compromise, but it does mean we keep building the bridge. We keep building relationship and we keep calling people to cross it. I wrote down my challenge for today. There's three questions and I don't want you to just discuss them as a family and with your kids. I, I wanna challenge you to actually pray through them today. This is one of those ones where I want you to pray through it. Three things. First one, God, where have I sinned against your children by trolling and with anger? This is a big deal. Um, I'm guilty of this. I have just found myself a lot of times being like, that group of people is ridiculous. And, da -da 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 -da. and then I look at my son watching me and receiving that sin from me to him. And I just think, man, that is not who I want to be. I want to teach my son right from wrong. I want to teach him that he has a higher calling and a higher authority that he's accountable to. But at the same time, I want to teach him to have a winsome, loving spirit and compassion and empathy for people who disagree with him. I want to teach him to win their hearts, not to hate people he disagrees with. That's the call of God on our life. Number two, God, who are you calling me to love and how? This is a big one. I think a lot of us in our life, like, need to really start praying because there's some people we're angry at. Listen, forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a decision that we make every single day. And there are groups of people in my life who say things that I think genuinely are bigoted and discriminatory towards what I believe. And all the time, I just, I need to practice. Like, Jesus, you are calling me to love that person. And I choose to forgive them. That's somebody's Eldon or Aurora. And lastly, who is one person with very different views that I'm praying for and in relationship with that I'm pointing to Jesus. And I think one of the great problems in America today is the answer for so many of us is no one. No one. And we sit down and we're like, this country is so messed up. We have all these problems. Listen, if all of our prayers were answered this week, would we see somebody far from God who is totally different than we are, filled with life in Christ? Do we even know somebody closely like that? That's a big conviction for me, personally. My wife and I, you know, we believe the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And there's lots of people that we're winning to Christ in our life who are similar. But then there's a few people in our life that we make sure that are in our life, that are very, very different than us, that hate a lot of what we believe and that are trying to troll us. And we say, we will not give up. We will not burn the bridge. We want to continue to understand and win your heart and love you. G guys, our church is hurting and God has a great call on our lives. I promise you next week is gonna be really encouraging. I've got a good one, but I wanted to start off laying a foundation for it. I wanna thank you for being a part of this. As we close, I'd like to invite you to have a prayer with me. Jesus, I thank you for this nation. I thank you for the privilege of living in this time and place in human history, all the comfort that goes with it. God, I just pray that you would let us be a part of bringing healing to a broken world through our relationships. I pray that you would make us people of love, compassion, empathy, but also people who are firm and clear and vision focused on what you call us to be. I pray that you would use the people of this church to bring healing and transformation to a broken world. God, help us not to be trolls, but to be people who imitate you, the way that you built relationships with people. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the marvelous, reckless love that you showed to us. I pray that we would give that to the world in the same way that you first loved us. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said amen and amen. I want to ask you guys to stand. The band is going to lead us in a closing song. And I don't just want this to be something we sing. I want it to be a prayer we declare about God's love to us that we pass to the world.